Uh, I'm going to bring a message today called Communion with God. Uh, this is going to be a two-part message, and somebody named 1611 is coming. And um, if you've been with us for any period of time, what we've been doing is we've been likening Saul to the Christian, and we've also been likening Samuel to Jesus Christ. So by this time, Saul has went through a lot of uh, testings, a lot of trials, and he's finally met with Samuel face to face, uh, even though he wasn't able to identify him when he first saw him, which I, which I tried to show was uh, pretty shameful, you know, a sad thing, you know. And, uh, but what I, what I wanted to look at now is that as he's actually getting to know Samuel, they start communing uh, one, one with another. Um, what the process actually is. And um, what we're going to be focusing on uh, as far as the Christian with Jesus Christ is majority of your communion with God will be mental. Now, the battle for your mind is real. If you think about television, YouTube, and media, what is it? It's all fighting to get your imagination. It's all fighting to get your thoughts. Now, let me give you an illustration. I was walking years ago in something we have out here called the Home and Garden Show uh, at the fairgrounds, and I got a really vivid picture of this. As I was walking down the aisles, uh, the vendors were doing everything they could uh, to get our attention, me and my wife. And uh, there were people approaching me with free samples. Uh, there was other people having raffles. They're like, hey, in five minutes, we're having a raffle if you want to win a car you know, and all these things. And other people were having light shows and smoke machines at their booths. And all of a sudden, uh, I realized I had more giveaways in my hand that I could carry out. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm saying this jokingly, but I bought a pillow for some reason, you know, and, and it was almost like this pillow was everything I needed. When, when I went there, I wasn't even thinking about a pillow. Now, why would that be? Now, at the Home and Garden Show, it's essentially a battle for your mind and your attention and your thoughts. Now, it's a business model of supply and demand, uh, where, except in many cases, it's to manipulate you to think that you have a need that you didn't even realize you had before you went into the place. You know, for instance, like my example with the pillow. You know, the guy does such an amazing promotional thing with a pillow that you're like, man, I need that pillow. And he just asked some question like, have you ever sweat on your pillow? And for some reason, he thinks that this pillow is going to be the, the answer to everything in your life. And, uh, and at some point, when, once they get your attention, they get you thinking. And that's when they create this model of, uh, of, um, of supply and demand. But they, they create the demand within you, within your mind. Now, uh, by getting you to buy into their product. Now, uh, it, the Bible is going to chime in and actually prove that Saul has the ability to control his mind. And since we're likening Saul to the Christian, um, I want to show you that you have the ability just as well to control your mind. Now, uh, in, in the, in the uh, spectrum of communing with God, communing with him. Now, we're going to look at, at our first point. It's going to be setting your mind. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 20, and it says, And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them. Now, the phrase, set not thy mind on whatever it may be, seems to imply that there's an act of will, uh, that when you decide to set your mind on something, you actually have that ability. Now, the thought life, I want to prove here, and just give me a little time to prove it. Uh, the thought life is probably one of the most crucial backgrounds that exist in this world, uh, crucial battlegrounds that exist in this world. Now, everybody wants your thought. Everyone, everybody wants you to focus on them uh, or what, what they want you to focus on. For instance, like, what, what, if, could you guess, what does the media want you to focus on lately? maybe since Friday the 13th-ish. Um, would anyone say COVID-19, maybe? You see what I'm saying? Is all they're giving you is one thing. So obviously they are trying to get you to think upon something, um, which is just supply and demand. Um, now, for the, most of the people that are getting whatever this thing is, is 
uh, it's a lot of it is asymptomatic, and we praise the Lord for that. But I mean, my wife's a nurse, and we have another new a nurse, Anne Marie. And I mean, the schooling they go through, there's bacteria everywhere. You know, that part of the school, and they have you look underneath your fingernails. They have you swab the toilet seat and look what's sitting on that thing. There's bacteria everywhere, but guess what? A lot of that bacteria will never uh, cause any symptoms in your life. So praise the Lord, we don't think about it. Unless they make you look at it through a microscope and they start getting you thinking about it, you see? Then you buy into what? Lysol. That's right. And um, But let's let's move on. And so... By setting your mind, you have this ability to focus on something, is, is what Samuel was, was uh, implying to Saul. Now, you as a Christian, uh, you as a Christian in this life, you, you have the opportunity to set your mind on things above or on things on this earth. Like, for instance, uh, what we're going to look at now, maybe you want to choose to uh, focus on your prolonged problems. Now, in verse 20, it says this. It says, and as for thine asses that were lost three days ago. Man, that was a long time ago. That was three days ago. Why are you so worried about what's happening three days ago when we're in today? You know, with, with some people, uh, maybe you're focused on what happened 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, maybe it was five. So I don't know. But the thing is, is, you cannot go back in the past and change the past. And a lot of people, they dwell and they live in the past. But every one of us has problems. Uh, some of them are bigger than others. You know, some of them are just different. Uh, some have lasted a short while, while others have had problems for years and years. But letting the problems you have overtake you, I'm telling you, today is a trick of the devil. Uh, he wants to blow your problems out of portion and overtake you. Saul had a problem that the man of God was already aware of. Uh, and yet, I want to point out to you, even though you have problems, the God-man, Jesus Christ, he's already aware of your problems. He still wants to deal with you, just like uh, Samuel was still willing to deal with Saul, okay? Knowing all of his problems, and uh, that should give you hope that no matter what you're going through, Jesus Christ, he knows what you're going through, and he still cares enough to give you time and give you his ear. Amen. Now, um, if you open your Bible up to John chapter 10, verse 10, For many verse, it should be. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus Christ gives us a description of the devil. Now, he says this. He says, The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. So we now know the devil's job description. It's three parts. Steal, kill, and destroy. Now, a thief, when, when he comes to work, he does the work of a thief. Uh, he wants to steal whatever he may from the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, somebody that's born again. He wants to steal from you. Now, for somebody who's not a believer, he can eventually steal their soul away to hell. Now, for somebody who's a believer, uh, he can never steal your soul. Thank God. Uh, he would he would have to be able to bring the bride of Christ, who is the very bone of his bone and flesh of Jesus Christ's flesh, to hell. For the devil to bring the bride of Christ into hell, he would have to bring Jesus Christ himself to hell, which we know will never happen. Uh, but what is the most valuable thing the devil can steal from you, Christian? What is it? Now, would it be your health or your finances or your job? I'm going to kind of go through these verses a little bit quick because with the, the room, it cuts off at every 40 minutes. And I apologize for that. Um, but just you, when it cuts out, you're just going to come back in and finish. But if you uh, write down these verses, it might be a little quicker for you. Or if you want to read them, uh, just be quick and flippant. The first one is Psalm 39, verse 4. Psalm 39, verse 4. And it says this. And our question now is, what is the most valuable thing that the devil can steal from a Christian? Now, Psalm 39, verse 4, it says, Lord, make me to know mine end, and the measure of my days, what it is. Psalm 89, verse 47 says this, remember how short my time is. And then uh, Psalm 90, verse 12, it says, so teach us to number our days. Now, I want to try to prove to you in the next few moments that I believe the most important thing that the devil can steal from the Christian is his thought life. 
his thought life. Now, um, the devil is if if the devil is successful in stealing your thoughts, um, which he often is with Christians, he can effectively render your your time null and void, and thus your life null and void. Now, in communion in communion with God, uh, focusing on the problems that we have must needs take second place to focusing on the problem solver. You know, you, the problems you have are not near as great as your Savior. Uh, the problems you have are not nearly as big as your God. Amen? The problem solver. So we looked at these prolonged problems. You have the ability to focus on the problems or to focus on the problem solver. So now we're going to look at our next thing. You can also set your mind on having some powerful decisions. Your, your, the ability to make decisions gives you empowerment. Now, uh, it says this, uh, we are in 1 Samuel 9, 20, as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, okay? Now, set not thy mind on them. Saul was told to control his thoughts and focus. He was told that he had to set out to do, uh, he, had, he was told that all that he was doing for the past three days was trying to find his dad's uh, lost asses that Samuel said, forget about all that. It happens a lot of times with people when they come to Christ. Uh, they will have a goal. They will have, uh, maybe I've, I've heard of a lot of Christians had miraculous jobs or like once in a lifetime jobs. And as soon as they got saved, God said, curb that thing and come, come follow me. And, you know, sometimes in life, you'll start out on a track, um, a goal or a dream. But often when we meet the Savior, he'll tend to say, forget about that. And he'll ask you to leave something like a job, like a hobby or a habit. Now, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, gives us a little further light on this. And it's in a context that you might not be too familiar with, um, some of us. Uh, but some of you maybe are more familiar with than it than me. So praise the Lord for you. But we're in Romans 12, 1, and it says this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Now listen to this, which is your reasonable service. Now I'll tell you for years and years, I used to preach this as it was it's the least you can do. It's only reasonable. Um, but I got thinking ab about this word reasonable. What is the root word of reasonable? Well, it's reason. Now, if you look into that word reason, what does reasoning have to, have to do with? It's your thought life. It, it's you keeping your brain intact while you're doing something for God. Uh, you're, you're not separating from the frame. You're not how a lot of Pentecostal churches want you to just let go, you know, and God will never ask you to just let go and detach your brain that he has given you to serve him with. And oftentimes, you know, the job of the believer is going to be using your brain in connection with the Bible uh, to make sure that whatever you're part of whatever you're doing is something biblical. Now, the fact is you have the ability to use reasoning skills, focus, and attention on whatever it is that you choose to. Now, maybe you've met others that you, you've met others and, oh, every time I talk to brother so-and-so, you know what they talk about? Their job, you know, and maybe every time you talk to them for the past five years, that's what they bring up, you know, or maybe you're one of those people that, you know, when they see you come and they run away because they want to talk about whatever it is. I don't know, but you... The human brain has the ability to really lock on whatever you choose and decide to focus on. Now, um, it's deliberate is what, I'm, is what I'm pointing out. Now, I know that this verse, Romans 12, 1, is not normally talking about like this. It's normally uh, uh, not in the light of ability, think, and reason. Uh, yet the idea is a biblical one. Uh, you have the ability and freedom, by the way, to think about what you want to. It, you have the freedom. Uh, there's an old, an old saying, it goes like this. Sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Now, what I'm trying to prove to you is that the battleground is your mind. The battleground is your thought life. Now, uh, let me go a little further now. If you want to open your Bible to 2 Corinthians 10, 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. And by the way, your thought life is what makes you an individual. Now, we're in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and it says this. 
It says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And look at this. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, why did the Bible bring these, uh, these uh, things up if you did not have the ability to cast some thoughts and bring thoughts into the obedience of Christ? Well, it's because you do have the ability. You don't have to sit there and, and worry about what happened to you 50 years ago or five minutes ago. You don't have to do that. You can focus on what the Lord has given you right now to focus on. Now, 1 Peter 1.13 says something similar. It says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, th this only brings up uh, the, the topic that you have the ability to gird up the loins of your mind. Do I just put that quote? Okay. Uh, th th this meeting is going to time out in a moment. We're, when it times out, we're just going to log back in. All right. <clears throat> so uh, also, I want to show you a couple verses now on the thought life. Uh, in Proverbs 24, 9, it says, the thought of foolishness is sin. The reason why they muted us, we're muted, right? One second. Yeah, I'm going to mute you, brother. One sec. Um, all right. So the, it says the thought of foolishness is sin. Now, if you did not have the ability to gird up the loins of your mind, to capture every thought, uh, what would God judge you upon your thought life then? Now, um, I want to show you uh, one more verse about that. And it's in Genesis 6, verse 5. This is this level of seriousness that God holds your thought life or just thought life of mankind. We're in Genesis 6, verse 5, and this is before God flooded the whole earth. And it says this, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, it wasn't long after that that God just drowned the whole earth with Noah's flood. But also, um, let me take a little side note here about the thought life. And I, I think we find something uh, interesting about repentance. Open up your Bible to Acts chapter 8 and verse 20. So you have the ability to set your mind on things, uh, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And you will give account for the time that you vested either in thinking upon the Lord or thinking upon your problems in yourself. Now, um, we're in Acts chapter 8 verse 20. Let me read a few verses, and I want you to look now, as we're going to find repentance to find, first is something inward. Look at this, Acts chapter 8, verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy now this is in the light of Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 20. Now Simon the sorcerer, uh, he had a business, and then he, uh, doing his sorcery, and then he sees the, the true men of God uh, getting people saved, and they're getting the Holy Spirit. And he wants to buy this thing. He wants to make it marketable. Uh, he wants to start, uh, you know, uh, scaling it out and, and making money off of it. And that's the background. Now, Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because thou hast, look at this, thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou is neither part nor lot in this matter. Look at this. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Verse 22 says, repent, therefore, this is thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Now, he was told to repent for what was just happening in his mind. Of, of course, it came out of his mouth, but he was told to repent for what happened in his mind. See, he had never taken this gift of God and started selling it on eBay or Amazon. And yet, uh, Peter looks unto him and, and says, you need to repent of what's going on in your heart and mind and thought life. Okay? That is the battleground. So we look first at prolonged problems. You can focus on those. We look next on powerful decisions. That you have a, a lot of ability to control your mind. And now... Uh, I want to look at the purpose for patience that we find in the Word of God. We're in 1 Samuel 9, verse 20. And it says, As for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them, because he had the ability to. He says, For they are found. Now, 
that should give you hope that God looks at all your problems today and he doesn't look just at today. He looks at them being solved tomorrow, being solved next week, next month, or maybe in eternity. God sees your problems solved already. And he looks at you and he says, you know, don't see your mind in those things. Can you guys give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, all right. I guess everything is fine on this end. Sorry. Uh, all right. Um, so for those that might be having trouble hearing, uh, look at your computer, please. <laughs> all right. Um, so I want to give you seven references to the mind found in Matthew chapter six. <clears throat> While you're turning to Matthew chapter six, I'll read you a couple of verses. We're going to read some verses out of Matthew 6. Proverbs 23, verse 7 says, So as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And Colossians 3, 1 and 4, uh, 1 through 4 says, To set your affection on things above. Let's look at that real quick. I apologize. Uh, Colossians 3. It says, If you can be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Then look at this in Colossians 3, 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear then, shall ye also appear with him in glory. So you have this ability to set your mind on some things. Now in Matthew 6, 24 through 34, bear with me. We got some verses to read. Um, we're going to look at what the Lord has to say about this thing. Now it says seven references to the mind. Now, no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man in verse 25. Therefore, I say unto you, look at this, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for the body, uh, what you shall put on. It is not the life more than me and the body than raiment. Verse 26. Behold, foul the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by, look at this, taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed um, <clears throat> like one of these. Verse 30. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. Verse 31. Therefore, Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Look at verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So my point is, is there's a lot of thinking going on about things that have nothing to do with the Bible, things that have nothing to do with God, things that have nothing to do with eternity at all. Now, and Randy, are you saying to minimize the situation with, you know, the, the state of the world and, and COVID-19? Uh, what I am saying is that Jesus Christ is more worthy of your thought life than COVID-19 is. Because COVID-19 will end one day. It will. <laughs> Amen. COVID-19 will be over and done one day. Now, uh, let's go ahead and press pause there. Uh, this thing is about to time out in one minute. And if you want to go ahead and we'll end the meeting and we're just going to log right back in, okay? Um, so just use the same number and, and code to log back in. I really apologize for the inconvenience. And meeting.